Hello, and uh, welcome to the director's commentary for The Flame and the Flood. This is the opening camp. Uh, we call this Camp Pinewood. This is kind of the continuation almost from... So there was the, the narrative goals with Camp Pinewood, and then there was also just straight up fun. Pinewood is, is one of the most special environments in the game for me. I think it, it's our... Watching people play, the first thing I, I sensed when watching playtesters play the game was in the opening camp, they immediately fell in love with the dog. And I think that's part of the, the narrative work that Sync did early on, even from uh, the Kickstarter. We had this scene where Aesop would drag this bag over to you and, and you would pet Aesop. And then Aesop would kind of playfully chase you around and in the entry camp, in the opening area, Aesop was always really happy. All the way through until you, you embark on the dock and um, you have this moment where you pet the dog on... Uh, as you start your journey. This built a lot of closeness between your character, Scout, and uh, Aesop the dog, and, and it, I think that actually resonated with people pretty well. I think that was something we were pretty successful with. I remember our goal related to that initially was to consider that the player character is a three-part entity. You have Scout, the dog, and the raft, and um, wanting players to quickly feel like that combination of pals was the, was the character, was your player, that the dog and the raft were a, a prime uh, extension of your character. And as, you, as things go awry in the game, the raft gets dinged up, and as well as you get dinged up, and, but Aesop's always by your side, your loyal dog. I thought, I was pretty happy with how Aesop turned out. I think he's a pretty lovable companion. So one of the most fun parts about being an animator on this project is every now and then I would just get a really awesome model from Sync and I'd think to myself, how can I push this and how can I have fun with this? And I remember this raft for the character when we first got it, I think everybody was imagining it would be this static raft. And I remember early on we were trying to come up with a way to transition between when you were on the river and when you were on land. And we needed some kind of visual to cover that up and so I kind of made this docking animation and I was like I was trying to figure out is there going to be a rope on every dock that you tie to the raft and then I just rigged up the raft so that the tire could come off and you could throw the tire over the dock and as I did it I thought to myself oh no this thing is going to kill me I totally messed up his model to do this and probably stretching it and he was like he liked it and that was kind of the beginning of the raft becoming a bigger and bigger thing. You know, he certainly didn't think in modeling or in the concept phase of creating that raft that it would be so modular or dynamic. It was really cool to see Gwen work her magic through rigging and, and animation to make that thing come to life. You know, the way it would rock, the way the planks would come off, the way the tire was used. It's amazing for how few back faces were put into that model. Yeah. How, uh... you keep in mind, I took the initial rafts and I made it have damage dates and I made it so that things could fly off and stuff. And then after the fact, we decided that we need to be able to upgrade the raft. We need to be able to bolt all these other things onto the raft. And you had this temporary shelter that was always there and that had to... Well, that was such a challenge too, trying to fit all that stuff oh, into man. like what amounts to a few pixels on screen. Yeah, you, I think crushed it with that stuff. Animating the raft is probably the most fun I've had across this game because between like the marina animations, the hit reacts, and the stuff flying off the raft. Definitely above and beyond what I thought we were going to end up with. I think it, it turned out pretty well. And it was a really fun collaboration with me and Sync. I really enjoyed doing that.
Yeah, so one of the things early on, you know, we were just starting the project, we were looking for mood and inspiration, and that meant, you know, looking at books and films and whatnot. And one thing that we started was, I think, a Spotify playlist, and we were just picking out different musicians and whatnot. And there was a guy, William Elliot Whitmore, that I really liked. He had an album called Field Songs, and it was just this very gravelly kind of country folk acoustic guitar stuff. And I started playing this for Sync and the folks in the studio. And, you know, we started building up this playlist and Sync at one point kind of interrupted and was like, you know, I, I know a guy who does this kind of stuff. And that, I think, sparked us working with Chuck. I think hearing that playlist initially, I think it was immediately apparent that was the direction we wanted to go, at least for me. I don't remember how far along we were and what reference point we were at when we decided to go for the Southern Wilds thematically. I think tunneling. it was pretty early. I think we sort of zeroed in on that pretty I remember walking through Kendall Square and you know it was really late at night and I get a phone call on my cell phone and it's Chuck sitting at a campfire in his backyard in between tours and he's wanting me to sit down right down in there while he riffs on his guitar and plays these first you know few sketches of the initial title track. Yeah, yeah, I, I love the story that you 